Hi, hi, hi. And welcome once again to a Beatles podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show where we talk about anything we feel like with the Beatles, their music, their history, the past, the present, sometimes even the future. We talk about their years together, the solo years, whatever comes to mind right here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this program. Hopefully, you know, you know me for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing, heard on about 45 radio stations at the moment. Also for another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's also a bi-weekly show that uh, is on Facebook and YouTube and really all over the place. And I'm being joined by my other two regulars. First of all, a guy that you know for being in New York radio for almost 40 years on WFUV. And he has been doing great programs, great interviews, sharing classic rock with new music and doing it in the best way, the way he knows how. And that's Darren DeVivo. You never know what I'm going to say. I'm starting to get, I'm starting to blush here. (laughs) Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to uh, the new show, Things We Said Today. It's not a new show. This is a new show. It's an old, anyway. As a video show. Hi. (laughs) <laughs> and my other co-host has been with us for many years now you know him for being the author of um the beatles from the cavern to the rooftop that book and also got that something how i want to hold your hand changed everything he's also been a writer for beetle fan magazine for many many years he's a freelance writer he worked for the new york times in their classical department and he's our own alan cozen hello alan hello ken and hello darren Hello. Hi, hi, hi. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the brand new docu-series that premiered last week on Hulu called McCartney 321 with uh, the producer Rick Rubin interviewing Paul and taking us through quite a bit of his career. And we will analyze that in just a few moments. But as usual, we have the latest news to get to. And as our last show actually was three weeks ago, we have quite a bit here, but we'll try to condense it all in uh, maybe about 10 minutes time, I think. First of all, Ringo's 81st birthday happened on July the 7th. Ringo posed in front of his 800 pound peace sign in Beverly Gardens Park to wish everyone peace and love at 12 noon with Barbara and friends, Joe Walsh, Jim Keltner, and Steve Lukather. And they also had a private party at Ringo's home in LA with a few members of the press. Around the world, fans sent birthday wishes and peace and love messages virtually at 12 noon, wherever they were. Online friends of Ringo sent their birthday greetings, including Paul McCartney, who wrote in, happiest of birthdays to my lovely mate, Ringo Starr, the drumbeat of my life. Love, Paul. Very nice right there. A new video is now on YouTube for George's demo of the song Cosmic Empire. George's box set for All Things Must Pass comes out on August the 6th. Also, Liverpool West Productions announced the digital release on July the 6th of The Beatles and Us, an award-winning documentary uh, portrait of Liverpool and the Beatles. The film goes into depth about the Beatles' hometown of Liverpool, exploring their evolving relationship and mutual impact. The Beatles and Us is available for digital download, rental, and streaming right now. The film details the influential character and traditions of the city on the Beatles' personalities and creative drive, and it looks intimately and affectionately at the city's culture, history, and people. It was selected as the best international documentary at the Venice Shorts Film Festival. That's uh, The Beatles and Us. I know uh, all three of us have seen uh, that little documentary. It runs about 25 minutes. Yep. Any comments you'd like to make about it from what you observed? Well, I, think I, I, didn't, I didn't. We're going to have. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think we're going to have the filmmaker on so um, we can talk to him in further detail. Okay. That might be happening pretty soon. Yeah. Our brand new book has just come out on the life of the late guitarist Jimmy McCulloch 
called Little Wing, the Jimmy McCulloch story from Paul Sally. It takes you through all the bands he was in before Wings and has his complete story. And it's now available on Amazon as both a paperback and hardcover. Also, I've heard that John Borak's book, The Beatles 100, 100 Pivotal Moments in Beatle History, has just been released. John is a journalist who's uh, written for many publications, including Goldmine Magazine. He's authored the books Shake Some Action, The Ultimate Power Pop Guide, also Shake Some Action 2.0, a guide to the 200 greatest power pop albums from 1970 through 2017. Also the book John Lennon, Life is What Happens, which came out in 2010. The Beatles in print together in solo, uh, their Facebook page announced that there'll be a new book coming out next March called Take a Sad Song, The Emotional Currency of Hey Jude by James Campion. The author dives deeply into the song's origins, recording, visual presentation, impact, and eventual influence, while also discovering what makes Hey Jude a classic musical expression of personal comfort and societal unity conceived by a master songwriter, Paul McCartney. Julian Lennon had news on his own website that he has received the Outstanding Impact Award from the inaugural Monaco Streaming Film Festival for his charity work along with the White Feather Fa uh, Foundation. A reminder that Peter Asher will be returning to the concert stage touring uh, this month in August with guitar great Albert Lee, also Kate Taylor, the sister of James Taylor, and bass guitar great Leland Sklar. I'm also told that uh, former Wings drummer Steve Holly is a part of the band. Um, I've learned of a new show since then for September the 18th as part of a 60s spectacular, and Peter will be performing for that show with Jeremy Clyde. Also on the bill will be the Yardbirds and Big Brother and the Holding Company. You can look for a list of Peter's concert dates at his website, which is PeterAndGordonTheSingles.com. That date, by the way, is September 18th. That is at the FM Kirby Center in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. There will be some more dates with Jeremy Clyde, from what I've heard on the horizon. On the podcast show, I Know I Know, uh, hosted by Hudson Ramy. Ramy. He and co-host for the show, Lucas Tanner, who hosts a Ringo podcast called Ringo Rama, interviewed Gary Burr, fellow roundhead who recorded several albums with Ringo during the Mark Hudson era and has continuously co-written a song on Ringo's post-Hudson albums. Gary indicated he has plans of writing a new song that will be on Ringo's next EP due out later this year. With special thanks to one of our listeners, Jody Newell, he told me that Apple Music has been promoting their new spatial music feature, also known as Dolby Atmos. And they are offering you the Beatles albums for Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road heard that way. Okay. Every now and then, uh, every now and then Life Magazine puts out an issue with lots of old Beatle photos. They have a new one out uh, with the four of them circa 1964 with the words then, now, forever on the front cover. And a reminder that uh, yesterday, this brand new book just came out called All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison, Clapton, and Assorted Love Songs from Ken Womack and Jason Krupa. And uh, Ken Womack, you know, for so many Beatles and Beatles-related books, one on John Lennon, one on the Abbey Road album, and um, he has collaborated with Jason, who you also know from a podcast called Producing the Beatles. So that book explores the relationship between George and Eric, culminating in uh, two classic iconic albums, With All Things Must Pass, and Layla, and their friendship that continued after that, that just came out. And we are hoping to have the two of them on this show. Uh, not that long from now. Also, July 23rd, this Friday, McCartney 3 Imagined gets released in physical format on vinyl and CD. And finally, I just learned this yesterday, a brand new documentary on George Martin's Air Studios called Under the Volcano explores 
Air Studios, which took place in Montserrat in the uh, Caribbean. Um, it is billed as the greatest music studio of the 80s. And Paul, Jimmy Buffett, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Earth, Wind and Fire, Dire Straits, The Police, The Rolling Stones, Duran Duran and Black Sabbath all recorded there. Air Studios was destroyed by Hurricane Hugo in 1989 and volcano eruptions. And uh, this documentary will be released digitally and also on DVD and Blu-ray on July 26th. That's next Monday. There are interviews with the police, Mark Knopfler, uh, Nick Rhodes, Majure, and more. I am told Paul McCartney appears in there briefly. All right. That's all the news that I have this time. By the way, I just want to make a little announcement here. As many of you know, I do this show and also Talk More Talk, the other podcast show. Both shows feature news at the top of the show. And there's always the chance that I've missed something that maybe you've picked up on news-wise. It is possible, Darren. So if there's something that you would like me to add to the show, which will also be heard in the other podcast show, you can always email me directly at everylittlething at att.net or also to us at our email, which Alan always gives out at the end of the show. Yeah. I can give it now too. All right. It is things we said today, radio show. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Mine's much easier though. Yeah. Every little thing at att.net. Okay. Okay, so our main topic for the show this time out is that brand new docuseries, McCartney 321, which premiered on Hulu. Paul taking you through uh, many songs throughout his career, very heavily on the Beatle years. And I just want to start by asking you guys the question, what was your initial impression when you saw this? And was it what you expected? Why don't we start with Alan? I'm not sure what I expected. Um, I guess it was sort of within the bounds of, you know, what a show like this could be. Um, I, uh, my initial impression, and I would have to say initial impression, meaning having seen the whole series, not just my initial impression in the first 20 minutes. Uh, my initial impression was that it was, uh, you know, obviously you can't say comprehensive because, you know, he mm. wrote how many hundreds of songs and, uh, you know, I didn't count the number that were talked about here, but there was um, quite a lot of stuff that uh, you don't hear him talk about that much. Uh, and for me, the most interesting stuff was that they, you know, soloed uh, some of the elements from within the tracks, particularly the bass. And as, you know, we've, we've talked about on this show plenty of times uh, what an astonishing bassist he is. I mean, in my view, um, mm. and I doubt I'll get an argument from you. But, um, you know, so, so the bass was a, a, a big focus, but, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering why Rick Rubin, you know, uh, as, as his interlocutor, uh, you know, I can think of a, a if, if he, he likes to be interviewed by celebrities these days, I can think of a, a lot of celebrities who uh, are, you know, closer to what he does than Rick Rubin is. Um, but, you know, his and Rick Rubin's enthusiasm was, uh, you know, an aspect of it that was sort of interesting to watch too. But anyway, on to you guys. Yeah. Just to bounce off what you said, I kind of knew, even with three hours, you're dealing with a 60-year career. There's no way you can cover everything. Um, but Rick Rubin, in a way, is kind of interesting. Uh, I found it a bit shocking how much he didn't know about Paul's history. Uh, sure, right. But at the same time, <laughs> he, he, he looked at everything. What he heard from the mixing board his observations came from that of an artist and a recording producer and with those kind of years. So he brought a different perspective to some of the Silver Hammer in particular and Obla Dio Obla Da. Uh, Darren, how about you? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, I found that, and I find this with, the, with, with all kinds of binge watching, which I don't tend to do that often. 
that um, having it broken into half an hour bite-sized pieces is great. So you could watch a couple of episodes and, and then, you know, step away from it a bit and come back with a clear head in anticipation of us doing this show. And the fact that this is uh, being recorded, what, like five days, give or take, uh, after it debuted on Hulu, I did kind of do uh, as much of a crunch as I could uh, on, the, on the whole three hours at once, which isn't the best way to, uh, to experience this, especially since it's several cam only a few camera angles in a dark studio with two people in black and white for three hours. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> I did read some comments about the documentary, uh, on Facebook, um, and generally speaking, those who did get a chance to see it in advance of its premiere on Hulu, and you'll explain to me how you were able to do that, um, <laughs> A lot of it, there were, I wouldn't say there was more negative comments. I think it was close to 50-50 with the common thing being, oh, Paul has told all of these stories already. So I very quickly uh, became enthused with the fact that, no, they were wrong. There are a couple. There's a sprinkling of the old stories that we always hear Paul tell, but it was done amongst so much information that I either didn't know or completely forgot about. Um, I liked the way it was structured. I liked that it wasn't a chronological look at McCartney's recording career. I liked that it jumped around. Initially, I was a little surprised that they were in one breath talking about Michelle and next thing it's Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. But then I realized, no, that's good because it, it, it almost it almost keeps you sharp and you're paying attention because like listening to a radio station, you're thinking, what song are they going to jump to next? And I think it's mm. in episode, it's in episode two where, I mean, you go from Penny Lane, Lady Madonna, the band on the run. And I, I liked that about the fact that it was not a chronological look where Rick Rubin sits down with Paul McCartney and says, okay, Paul, let's start at the beginning uh, and they start deconstructing songs and talking about things in chronological order, which could have been, could have made it tedious. This is uh, exciting the way it's done. Um, um, I like that Rick Rubin's hosting this because I've always admired him as a producer. Um, Rick, Nigel Godrich, just two of the more contemporary producers of the past 20, 25 years that I've admired. Um, hmm. I absolutely worship the uh, recordings that he did with Johnny Cash. I think they may very well be the most important recordings Johnny Cash had ever issued in his lifetime. And it came right at the end with Rick Rubin's uh, um, leadership, for lack of a better word. Um, and I think Rick Rubin comes from a place where it comes from a different world than like, uh, I think you mentioned Ken, than mm. where Paul is. And that's good because he's giving McCartney and the Beatles an ear, um, that is better known for rap and Americana, um, a band like the Avet Brothers is a band that he's been producing now a bunch of their albums. Um, but now here is this guy, Rick Rubin, you think of, you know, uh, Def Jam Records and Johnny Cash. And here he is deconstructing the Beatles and Wings with Paul McCartney sitting right there. I think McCartney enjoyed talking to him because he was McCartney was getting an angle from uh, a different music voice that he doesn't tend uh, to be around. Maybe sort of like working with Nigel Godrich on Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. Mm. Here McCartney's being interviewed by a Rick Rubin who you wouldn't necessarily uh, think of the two of them together. I'd love if they work together now from this. Uh, it'd be great if Rick Rubin produced a, 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 the next McCartney record, but 
Uh, I, I will admit that I, I, I didn't really digest the last three parts as closely as I would have liked uh, in time of doing this show, but um, I'm, I'm assuming parts five, four, five, and six are pretty much the way one, two, and three went. And one, two, and three, I really, really enjoyed. There's lots of bits in there um, that appeal to me, might not be the same ones that appeal to you, Alan, or you, Ken, but I laughed out loud at uh, how when John and Paul would get into an argument when they were younger, Paul would call John Four Eyes. <laughs> and John's name for Paul was Pigeon Chest, right? Is that, mm. that was, right? It's here in my notes somewhere. I can't read my yeah. notes. Anymore. But I laughed out loud at that. Um, I, I don't believe I ever heard that before either. No, there's one yeah. thing you never heard yeah. before. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed the story Paul has told many times about the piccolo trumpet in Penny Lane and how he heard it the night before uh, and went to George Martin and it ended up on Penny Lane. I like the way the story was told here in this documentary. It's a little more detailed. Um, and they use video clips of uh, the instrument being played in uh in another, what was it, the Brandenburg? Concerto. Concerto. Mm -hmm. um, seeing it, seeing a performance of that is just 30 seconds of it, of the instrument being played. I just think it really focused in and um, helped explain something that I knew and have heard many times in, in brighter detail. Uh, I enjoyed Paul talking about his experience in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, recording band on the run um, and uh, you know getting to see fellow QT perform live and and how Paul was moved by the performance uh, I did think it was a little interesting that he was I wouldn't say dismissive but you know a couple of guys in the band left the night before the trip to Africa well I mean Paul say you know Denny Sywell and Henry McCullough yeah, Henry, uh, Henry left several weeks earlier. It wasn't the night before, which he, he's... Yeah, I, yeah, and I've read a few weeks, but when I've heard that Paul say or allude to it, it's kind of like turned into something for, uh, for a film, mm -hmm. for dramatic effect, the night before. Um, he just, um, I don't know about in the uh, later uh, episodes, but he sort of just glossed over mentioning Denny in passing. Not Denny, he does but... that all the time. You know? you know, and somebody who doesn't know, like we know, the history of Wings, hearing Denny's name mentioned once doesn't mean anything. Um, but then again, there's also moments where Paul was giving incorrect facts here and there. I mean, he's trying well, to remember, you know, 50, 60 years of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so um, maybe he forgot uh, Henry McCullough's name. I mean. But all in all, this is a treat, a treat that, that I that I suggest watch in pieces um, um, or binge watch if you could do that. But I, I enjoyed it uh, watching it, uh, you know, broken up. And I've heard that it will not be coming out on a physical format, um, which I think is a shame. Yeah. Uh, Where did you hear that? Where did you I hear that? don't recall. I don't recall. I heard it in uh, Facebook and I've heard it through the rumor mill that there has been no. Uh, indication it's coming out uh, on disc to me that's important to some people it's not uh, I'd love to physically have you know something that I could pop in a player and watch when I want um, in a way you know what it reminded me of the documentary that came out I think it was called the Paul McCartney show when press to play came out there was a, a VHS documentary where Paul talked about his career and up to press to play. And it was, you know, condensed down into what, an hour, 90 minutes, maybe. Here, Paul was now expanding on his entire career over a span of three hours. And uh, it was, it was, it was a good watch. Yeah. Uh, I will, I will agree with you, uh, Darren, and it's a good point to be made. Rick Rubin, someone who is listening to this music with modern ears. That's what I think he yeah. brings to the table here. It's kind of like, I find it fascinating whenever I 
talk to or interview young Beatle fans and young podcasters and how they're hearing Beatle music and solo Beatle music in this day and age. Yeah, and, but, and uh, just young ears, different ears. You know, yeah. a guy who, uh, a Jewish guy from Long Island who played a major role in establishing rap uh, and a record executive and a musician and a guy who today, like I mentioned, the Avet brothers immediately pop in my head because uh, they've, they've worked on a bunch of albums now together. Um, you know, different ears. You don't think the Beatles and the Avet brothers, when in reality, uh, you know, the two different worlds probably have more in common than we know. Mm. Yeah, I um, I will say that prior to watching this, we all got to see online there was a synopsis for each episode. And when I watched the docuseries, I couldn't tell the difference between one episode and another. It all just flowed together very well. Just randomly picking songs throughout Paul's career and talking about them. I didn't really pick up a theme for each episode. So I was kind of surprised that it was broken down the way it was with a description because I really couldn't tell <laughs> one episode from another. But um, I'm kind of surprised that I enjoyed it as much as I did because I've always gone on about the solo careers of the Beatles. And at this point, the bulk of McCartney's work is his solo career. You know, we're talking about 50 years of solo music. Um, but obviously, you know, there's no denying the importance and the greatness of the Beatles catalog. And I just kind of wish that it was more spread out throughout the decades of his music because the most recent songs that they played of his were uh, Waterfalls and Check My Machine, both released in 1980. And you've got another 40 years of music there. So to some people, this could be nitpicking, but to me, you know, a, a really good overview would be taking a look at music from all the decades um, yeah, there should be a special focus on the Beatle years because they were so special and revolutionary. I just wish that he had sp spent more time with post Beatles music. Um, how much should be solo is up to the individual fan, I suppose. But um, yeah, but I still loved, especially hearing all the isolated tracks. Oh, yeah. Those were such a treat. Stuff that I never heard before. And we're going to talk about what are the highlights for each of us. I know you already mentioned a few, Darren. Kind of but, did. Um, well, same again. <laughs> sounds better the second time around. But um, there are the things that Paul talked about, and then there are things that were played. But of the things that he mentioned, you know, there are a lot of things that he's repeated through the years. And by the way, that's another thing about this series is that it's really aimed towards both a casual fan and because of all the isolated tracks and all that, that's really for more the hardcore, I would say. So it's a mixture, I think, that what he was aiming towards with this series. But um, there were a lot of well-worn out stories that Paul has said, but they're worn out to us. <laughs> they're not worn out to the casual fan and new Beatle fans who, you know, Paul brings up yesterday and dreaming it, you know, some of us have heard that hundreds of times already, but I like the fact that he mixed some of that with a few new stories here and there. What were some of the surprises for you, Alan, of what he talked about that was kind of new for you? Or maybe he told the story a different way from what you know, we're used to hearing. Actually, I mean, you know, there was one story that he told as he's told it in the past that, you know, someone really needs to pull him aside and say, look, Paul, unless you have perfected time travel, that story is not possible, which is here, there and everywhere. He says specifically, you know, I mean, I originally thought maybe his chronological problems with that song had to do with when he wrote it and maybe when he recorded a demo. But he said, after we made the record, which was Revolver in 1966, we were doing some filming in Austria for help. And John told me that he liked that song particularly. So that can't have happened, right? Um, you know, and, and 
you know, if Rick hmm. Rubin knew a little more about the Beatles, he could have stopped him and said, look, let's do a retake here because it, it can't have been that way. You know, John, no, no question. You know, no, no one is questioning that John said that he really liked it, but it can't have been during the filming of Help if it was after recording the track. So, mm. uh, but there were some, uh, you know, like you say, plenty of other things that he hasn't gotten into a lot. And um, one of them that struck me right in the first episode uh, was, you know, apart from bass, Rick Rubin was very fascinated with the background vocals and for real good reason, um, and soloed a lot of them in a really fascinating way. Um, but in episode one, Paul talked about how, you know, George Martin would say, okay, you sing this part, these are your notes, you sing this part, these are your notes, and would put them together that way. And, <laughs> excuse me, um, I was a little puzzled by that in a way. I mean, I had assumed that the Beatles came up with their own harmonies. And we know, for instance, at the end of She Loves You, there was a dispute between them and George Martin about whether it should end on that sixth chord. He didn't think so. They did, and they got their way. Hmm. Um, so obviously, just because Paul is now saying that, you know, George Martin said, okay, you know, you sing these notes, you sing these notes. Um, doesn't mean necessarily it was every way, but uh, I mean, on every song, but uh, I, I was interested to hear that at least that went on some of the time because it also gave um, a, a sort of a, a new bit of dimension to what George Martin did as their producer. You know? mm. um, a lot of people talk about how he did the arrangements and the, and the Beatles have always said, well, yes and no. Um, but this kind of shows the degree to which he did the arrangements on the vocals. Um, but he may have been talking about particularly early on, you know, I, I'd love to hear him talk a little bit more in depth about that and, you know, what they brought to it and what George Martin brought to it, because harmony was always one of their things. And it was always one of the things they admired about the Beach Boys, which he also talked about, I, I right. too. Um, I like Can I mention one more thing because you, you were talking about Michelle I found it interesting that they brought up Edith Piaf's recording of My Lord mm -hmm. and that being influential in that yeah. I never heard Paul say that before did you? That was a new detail you know the rest of the story we'd heard about it being a party piece and wanting to attract yeah. all that but that uh, as the source of it, that was new information, and that was that was good. There was a lot, you know, you know. I think as as, as Darren said, there were, there were a lot of stories that we've heard a lot, but there were also more details around those stories, and that, in a way, you know, made the story worth hearing again. You know, um, but also, uh, you know, someone put a comment on Facebook saying, "Yeah, I know we've we've heard all these stories, but you know, I'm." trying to bring up my uh, kids the right way, you know, liking the Beatles. And, uh, you know, they're watching this now and they're hearing the stories for the first time. So fine. Right. You know, uh, it's like, you know, 18 seconds out of my life to hear that he dreamed yesterday again. I can handle it, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the context of all of this, um, in the context of getting to hear those isolated vocals. I also liked um, with the vocals, um, I can't remember which song it was, um, but it was the one where they sustained the vocals for a really long time. Oh, is that Dear Prudence? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That was fascinating. You don't really hear that on the record if it's if yeah. it's not being soloed. It just is part of the general ambience. I think if you went back now and listened, you'd hear it. Um, I thought there was another funny moment, like Darren was saying, you know, that made him laugh out loud. Uh, uh, when they were doing, uh, I think, a day in the life, and uh, there was there was sort of a, a vocal that just missed, you know, and obviously was faded out when they did the mix, and mm. all sort of moves back, and he says, "This is why we don't go into tapes, Rick." <laughs> I thought that was. Um, I think that was Lucy in the Sky, wasn't it? it might have been, yeah, 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 have. yeah. I thought it was one of the Pepper songs. Okay. Um, uh, 
So, yeah, you know, the, the, the soloing, um, to, to get back to the Penny Lane trumpet solo, um, I enjoyed hearing the discussion of, you know, which notes were technically out of the range of the piccolo trumpet and how Paul said, well, you can do it, and he did it. And then they played that track soloed, which is really astonishing and uh, mm -hmm. even more astonishing that it is on the record. Um, so really there was a lot of that stuff and a lot of the soloing of the bass. Um, and Rick Rubin read him that quote from John about how, you know, Paul is uh, often coy about his bass playing, but, uh, you know, he's one of the great bassists and, and, uh, and that's true. Um, so hearing these bass parts soloed, uh, you know, you hear them on the record and especially in the remixes, they're, they're more prominent. Um, but, you know, he really was producing a line of counterpoint um, against the melody, against everything else going on, and it fit just incredibly. What he didn't say, Rick Rubin kept saying, so, you know, was, did, did you work this out in advance or was it just in the day? And he's saying, oh, no, we didn't. Um, but that's not entirely right, because we do know that Paul would sort of wait until the very end of the track's production to add the bass. So he's actually had a lot of time to think about what he's going to do and mm -hmm. he, hear the track over and over and to think about those contrapuntal possibilities that, that he really capitalized on. Um, so, you know, I think maybe he should have said that and maybe he did and it was cut out. Who knows? I want to see all the outtakes. Yeah. There's, uh, there's so much you can do when you edit something like this that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that could have, that was probably left out that we don't even know about mm -hmm. that could have added more dimensions to what was said. You know, I wanted to bring up Penny Lane for one reason here, um, because Paul actually said, and I wanted your reaction, Alan, our favorite composer was Bach in the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that music. Yeah, that basically what he says. Our favorite composer was Bach, was because he because he was doing a lot of the kind of thing we were doing. Which I don't know what he means by that, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's, it was, there's also the point where he praises Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, uh, I have heard and how much he hoped to collaborate with him one day. I don't think he said that. <laughs> There's uh, an yeah, edited version of that, uh, of that, and that's the one that, that Alan watched. Uh, that, uh, that Dear Prudence part was great with that sustained note, which now when I hear the song, I will hear that note, um, thinking that, hey, wow, they recorded that in 1968 when they actually had to hold it. Today, you know, it probably would be created, you know, with a computer. Um, for, for and I always, you know, I always thought this for guys who smoked, yeah, they were able to do a lot of things vocally, uh, which I find amazing, mm -hmm. and that would be a perfect example, uh, you know, hitting and holding that note in Dear Prudence as long as they uh, as long as they did. Um, it was at the beginning of part one when uh, Paul opened my eyes a little bit to uh, John's rhythm guitar playing. Mm -hmm. It's easy to, when you're listening to uh, any band, um, it's easy to kind of let, you know, the, certain parts of the of a song go past you. The rhythm guitar, for example. Um, and here Paul was pointing out, could it have been All My Loving? I didn't write down. It was. Song. It was. All My Loving, where John's rhythm part about how hard it was to continually strum and change the chords as they did. Hmm. Um, and then they jump to a clip of them performing it, uh, the Beatles performing it live. And wa I'm watching John and I'm going, aha, you know, they're just these little aha moments where a little more light is, is uh, put upon something that uh, you didn't, you know, and, and it's seen with such and heard with such a clarity that you never had the opportunity to, to 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 experience it in the past now you know i listen i'll, I'll listen more but i know what i'm listening for with john rhythm playing or be it paul's bass playing or uh, or uh, a piccolo trumpet 
Rick Rubin seemed on, on more than one instance to be amazed at um, the sound Paul was getting from his bass. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it was While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Yep. Uh, he was really like knocked out by McCartney's uh, the gr- aggressiveness of Paul's bass playing, which I've heard, you know, I can hear it in the mix, but then they isolate a por- portion of it. And it's like, wow. I mean, what was he doing? You know, what was he using? Uh, you know, uh, what was he using for a pick? And I mean, and you could hear that there was some plucking involved, which maybe, you know, didn't jump out when you're listening to the final mix. But for that short period of time, they deconstruct it and allow Paul face to come uh, come out right up front. So. That's just mm. another one of the little little examples of things. Uh, you folks, when you watched, if you haven't done so already, there'll be things that are going to hit you and jump out at you and really make you smile that, you know, you didn't expect uh, to hear, whether it be a deconstructed song or a story or, you know, or the fact that uh, Paul has a pigeon chest. <laughs> now, the thing about All My Lovin', you know, if if you ever talk to musicians who have studied the Beatles, many of them have pointed that out, that it's very easy to overlook the rhythm guitar playing on All My Lovin', but what John has to play is very fast, and he's got to do it continuously, you know, except during the, the All My Lovin', I will send to you that part, but the rest of the song, you know, constantly playing fast, and he had to do that live, too. So I like the fact that Paul, you know, pointed that out. And likewise, even though this is nothing new now, um, I like the fact that, that Paul brought up the four notes that George came up with for And I Love Her to start off the song. But beyond that, he also pointed out the other guitar playing that he did throughout the song where he's playing individual notes, mm-hmm. which really adds a lot of color to the song, you know? There's so many things that are very easy to overlook in Beatles recordings. And I like when, when Paul is giving uh, credit to the other guys. Um, one thing I wrote down here uh, that I was surprised at what, what Paul said when talking about John, um, <laughs> he wore glasses and I didn't. You know, there are these photos that we've seen of Paul yeah. in the studio with the, with the black rimmed glasses, those thick glasses that he didn't show in public but he wore glasses too so i don't know why he's saying that that john wore them and he didn't yeah what's with the with the glasses on paul mccartney there's just a couple of studio shots where he's got glasses yeah. on. i think i first saw them in the, the beatles recording sessions the mark lewison book i think and i was kind of surprised yeah. you don't see it that often but it's not like paul wasn't wearing glasses too um Maybe I like pigeon chest also. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna keep bringing that up, aren't you? <laughs> I don't um, the inspiration behind the song "Single Pigeon" was John Lennon <laughs> telling him he had a pigeon chest. Um, I may be up to that. Must mean, but what what does three two one mean? Like, what is that about? Um, counting. <laughs> no, I think it's three, two, one, like counting in three, two, one, McCartney. That's, hmm. that's well, that's a weird. I don't, I don't know. think there's anything else to it. Okay, counting into a song. This is the beginning of something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it's called we that. Count in forwards, and that's backwards. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> <that> Paul <laughs> McCartney is dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, embedded in you know certain things here. Um, also, where was this shot? It, it didn't look to yes. me like studio, but it was so dark you couldn't tell. But there was a lot of wood around, and uh, it, it, it looked as if they had they were doing this in a filming studio where they just got the board right in the right, which kind of is odd. But I wondered the same thing. Mm. I, 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 it didn't appear that it could be Paul's personal studio at his home studio, just from the way it was laid out. And there's certain angles where you almost get the impression is an upstairs. Mm-hmm. And then I started to think, you know, I wonder if this is just uh, a sound studio uh, and they constructed it. It's so dark, you can't tell. 
where they put a, a board, you know, um, you know, set up a makeshift studio for the purposes of having a board and being able to manipulate, um, even if that's even live. I don't know. I guess you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing that struck me as odd is that, um, okay, here's this whole production and it's in black and white. And you're thinking, um, why is it in black and white? But they bring in pictures and they bring in pictures that were in black and white, but they're colorized now. <laughs> so what, <laughs> you know, just little things like that, you know, sort of uh, seemed odd to me, you know. We need to get Rick Rubin on the show to mm. explain all this. That's a good idea. Or you know, Paul. I, just, I just thought of something, maybe one of my last observations of, uh, of uh, again, little minute details that just happened to catch my eye that I have really found fascinating. Ringo has told the story about how hard it was to play live and that he couldn't hear the other three. And he's because he's behind them, too. And he, Ringo will make the joke that he's watching them shake their bums. And that's mm -hmm. how he was able to stay in uh, keep the beat which i find hard to believe that it was that he had to hear something um but there is one clip and i don't remember what song it was or where the performance was taking place there is one clip where ringo clearly does not know where they're in in the song and he's not playing he's not playing he's just kind of doing this something to this effect and then when it comes around to the chorus he knows it's coming Boom, boom, and then he goes in and resumes playing, uh, playing the song. Uh, I, I again, I don't know. I did not write it down here in my notes um, what song it was or where it was, but that was fascinating. There was he, there was that issue uh, of not being able to hear each other when they play live. For the first time ever, I'm seeing it right before my eyes. Ringo's not playing because he probably lost where they were in the song but knows where he's got to jump back in. Um, oh. I'm going to make a guess that it might've been in the third part um, or two. Um, so look for this clip. It's of, uh, you know, an early, early-ish song. Um, okay. Interesting. You've given us more of a reason to rewatch. Right. As, as, um, uh, as Ed Norton says, I look for the small details. <laughs> <laughs> small details. The small That's right. details. <laughs> um, I like the fact that um, in the series, they pointed out the song Babies in Black that was a favorite of the groups, enough to keep it in their live shows. You know, when you think about the music that they were recording then, and you might think, oh, you know, why not No Reply, for example? Or, um, well, I'm a Loser, they were doing briefly, right? think so. Alan? Yes, they did. Yeah. So, but Babies in Black, they kept in. So it was just a favorite of theirs, maybe because it was just in three, four time. Um, Paul talking about how the Everleys were a massive influence on their harmonies. Mm -hmm. um, I liked when he brought up Nowhere Man. He called it a very cutting edge solo that was played. They, they uh, put a lot of treble on the recording there. Um, Maxwell Silver Hammer, the bass sounded like a tuba, <laughs> which I never thought about before. Yeah. But, you know, um, yeah. Uh, as I was saying earlier, Rick Rubin brought his own ears to the table here, and he liked the fact that Maxwell Silver Hammer sounded like an old style traditional song mixed with a new instrument, the Moog synthesizer. Mm. Okay. Um, something I found kind of odd was when talking about his father, Jim McCartney, he referred to him as an amateur musician. I don't think I ever heard him call him an amateur musician before. Um, and, you know, Paul's always talked with reverence about, about his father. Also, um, he brought up the fact that, you know, and, and he said this many times that they would have New Year's Eve parties and Jim would play at the piano. And but here he's saying that that his father developed arthritis mm -hmm. and that led to Paul playing the piano more, which I never heard before. 
you know, it's these little things, the small okay. details okay. that, um, you know, that, that crop up in, uh, in this documentary. When you're used to hearing a story told the same way over and over, just the slightest little difference, you know, your ears pick up. And uh, I never heard Paul bring that up before. Um, he also brought up the song, If You Gotta Make a Fool of Somebody, the James Ray song, which I thought was really interesting. The Beatles used to do that live. But um, he said that the Beatles never heard that kind of beat uh, in the song. Um, and James Ray also was the guy who recorded Got My Mind Sent On You. And George, when he was here in the States, when he visited in Illinois, um, you know, 1963, he bought the album from James Ray, brought it back. And then that's how they learned that song, If You Gotta Make a Fool of Somebody, which also Freddie and the Dreamers had a minor hit with. Um, observations about a day in the life I thought were interesting. Uh, talking about the orchestral buildup, that the string section were pretty conservative and playing the same thing, but the brass were more free to play what they wanted. Um, yeah, uh, just little things. Just mentioning the fact that he loved the kinks and you really got me. I hardly ever yeah. hear the Beatles bringing up the kinks. I think that was the first time I ever heard them um, heard a any of the Beatles kind of uh, say that they were into the Kinks, right? mm. and they really liked that song. Yeah. Also, and Paul has talked about this. Um, I think frequently in recent years that they never wrote anything down. The reason being is if they were coming up with a new song, they figured that if you couldn't remember it the next day, it wasn't that good. So it forced you. Only the best stuff is what you remember. So it's not like they had a, a portable recorder by their side every time they had an idea and recorded something into it. So they thought that was a good way of judging material. So I found that interesting. Hmm. I've always found that interesting that they could remember. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I talk to somebody on the phone five minutes after I hang up. I don't even know who I talk to, <laughs> you know, and, you know, the, here they're remembering songs. Mm. Well, if you can remember what you wrote the next day without writing anything down, it's got to be something memorable. So they had that kind of uh, thought process going. Paul also said, this is another thing that I kind of have a problem with. He said, in Hamburg, we played so many hours, we didn't want to get bored, which led them to writing songs. Now, you know that Paul has said this quite often because he's talked about the Beatles would have certain songs that they covered. And if they were on the same bill with another band that covered some of the same songs, that didn't, that didn't look good for the band to do the same material. But at the same time, you also know that early on, Paul was writing songs on his own. And John was writing songs on his own in the in the fifties. They were writing songs, yeah. And um, you know, I forget the exact number, but there there's this. Um, I forget where I read it, but you know that both John and Paul were asked how many songs did they write before they were famous, and John would say something like ten, and Paul would say a hundred, and later on, Paul said he was exaggerating, right. but they were writing material. You know, I think this gave them more of a reason to write material. Yeah. But um, Paul also has said one of the things that that drove him to John was knowing that he wrote material, too. Yeah. Um, it's uh, that that is one of those big question marks, because, uh, you know, it also came up it, for, for me, at least in reading the first volume of Mark Lewison's book, Tune In. Mm. Uh, he pretty much says that writing was not their principal thing. They came to it later. And I think he agrees that uh, the reason the stuff even got performed by them publicly was, uh, was for the reason Paul gave this time to fill out the set with stuff that people couldn't copy. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I had always before Tune In came out thought of them as um, actively writing and wanting to write for the group to perform. But it seems as if their early writing 
and the Beatles as a group or the Quarrymen as a group, et cetera, um, were separate things. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what, you know, how they thought of it exactly. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about, you know, what, how they, how they viewed songwriting versus performing, but apparently bringing the two together was something that happened later. It, it, hmm. It's weird. It doesn't make sense because if you're in a, if you're in a group, if you play music and you write songs, you would assume that you would want the group to play the songs you're writing. Right. I mean, that's the way it, works today but maybe in the late 50s early 60s it didn't but you know that that all of us who study their history we've heard titles like and and paul performs it in this this docuseries thinking of linking <laughs> and he's talked about just fun and to bet about sorrows and you know that there are certain songs like one after 909 is an early song that's a lennon mccartney song well, You've heard that that what goes on is supposed to be an early song. Thinking of linking as a, a McCartney Harrison, like in spite of all the danger. Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure how explicit he was about it in talking about it. Uh, he talked about how he and George were doing it, but in the credits at the end gave thinking of linking Paul McCartney, George Harrison as the as the writer credit which raises yet a whole other question about why was George not included in the songwriting early? You know, Paul mm. talks about how he didn't think George was that interested, but, you know, I think we know that George was interested. He, he wasn't really being given a chance. Um, but here are, uh, um, you know, and, and Cry for a Shadow is Lennon Harrison. Right. So we now know of at least three songs and we know the songs and they're not bad. So, interesting question. Well, they probably didn't think much of those songs. I mean, George Harrison spoke about Don't Bother Me as though that was his first song. Right. His first song written entirely by him. But he probably dismissed the other ones. Could be. Could be. Hmm. Anything else that you guys found really interesting about, uh, about the series? I mean, uh, I... Darren? I I, I think I basically, you know, all the things that are uh, on the first viewing and uh, I think the, w what jumped out of me from the first viewing I've shared, um, um, I look forward to, you know, watching it again. And like I said, maybe if we're lucky, it'll, this is again, important to me, it'll come out on disc, but in the meantime, um, no, I think I basically touched on everything I wanted to. Um, I thought it was really, really cool, very well done. And, uh, you know, between three hours of Paul talking about his music and we have three hours of uh, Peter Jackson's Get Back coming, uh, it's three hours, right? No, it's more than six, that. six hours. Uh -huh. um, that's what I'm talking about, you know. Lots, lots to look forward to, lots to watch, and lots to uh, absorb and get lost in. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about the isolated tracks when you hear just the bass and drums of something mm -hmm. like Come Together. Mm -hmm. And then, again, it's, it's, I, it's important for Paul to explain how he slowed down the song Come Together because it was too close to Chuck Berry's song. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah, right. I remember, yeah. I liked also um, the, the degree to which, you know, it was scattered through, it wasn't all at once, but um, he, he really also does talk about his influences quite a bit. I mean, he talked about the Beach Boys, he talked about, and, showed, and they showed film of James Jamerson, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, it, while this was sort of a celebration of what Paul did musically, he also brought in a bit of perspective of, you know, what it was that he was listening to that, uh, that, that inspired him to do the things he did. I, I thought that was uh, an interesting point and a good point. And uh, like, like you say, slowing down, um, come together to avoid the copyright issue that came and bit them anyway. Um, <laughs> it was sort of interesting. Yeah. Also, it's, it's nice to see Paul react to this music and see how much he's enjoying it. 
Um, I love when they were playing the the dual guitar lines and and your bird can sing. That's a real high moment for me. And um, you know, there's there's so much great stuff all throughout these six hours. I only wish I wish there was more of this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this is like a teaser because I I really wish, like I said earlier, that there would be so much more on the solo music, and like I said, the last forty years of recorded music were completely ignored here. He did actually play a brand new song of his on the piano. Yes, he did. He did, and I wonder what that is. Hmm. I wonder if it'll come out because <laughs> it just it could just be what he's writing at the moment and. He you know, may not feel it's good enough to come out. So, to piggyback off of what uh, you just said, uh, I made a note here that uh, at the beginning of the third part, um, you get a kick out of seeing the genuine joy in Paul's face uh, while they were listening to Back in the USSR. Hmm. You know, and uh, Paul tells a story uh, about how he ended up playing drums on it. He, he made it sound like Ringo said, "You play it then." Um, I'm not sure if. I've always heard that that was around the time that Ringo walked out. Uh, and yeah, well, there. there are stories that you hear that Paul wasn't happy with Ringo's drumming on the song and it led to him walking out. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but um, that's why Paul ended up drumming on there. Yeah, but and apparently they, on Dear Prudence, too. They, they take it, deconstructing back in the U.S. I saw Paul just as glowing. Loving hmm. hearing this again after over 50 years. Yeah. There is one story that I wish we would get a, a definitive answer out of Paul. I mean, I, I, I don't like the way that he explains it, but this is going all the way back to 1980 in the McCartney interview with Paul Gambaccini. He's talking about when the Beatles came here to America and Paul said to Brian Epstein, you know, we swore we wouldn't come here unless we had a number one record. And I've never quite understood what exactly he meant by that. He couldn't have meant we wouldn't have come on the Ed Sullivan show <laughs> because the contracts were already signed, you know, at that point. Yeah. Um, I, I take it to mean, but he's never actually said this, that we wouldn't tour America until we had a number one. That's just me. You know, yeah. it, it's hey. taken me all these years to interpret it that way. And I still could be wrong, but nobody's ever cornered him on this because it makes no sense no. To, for, for people to think, oh, they wouldn't have been on the Ed Sullivan show unless they had a number one. Everything just fell into place. <laughs> it's easy for Paul to say that if that's what he means by Ed Sullivan. Yeah. But, you know, it would have been foolish, even if I want to hold your hand flopped for them not to be on the Ed Sullivan show. Right. <laughs> Well, and in the anthology, they, they had that, you know, scene where Paul talks about uh, exactly that. We weren't going to go to America unless we had a number one record. And then it talks about, I want to hold your hand getting to number one. And then they cut to George saying, and it was a handy thing because we were booked to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a little bit of contradiction in there that... Um, the Beatles never came to the United States. They had 15 number two singles that never were able to crack to number one. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I, under, I understand Paul's explanation about how they would see that British acts would come here to America and not do all that well. They would have one hit and that was it. And they'd always be fifth on the bill on, on a concert tour. I understand that. And they didn't want to be in that same in that same category they wanted to be the number one act on the bill so by the time june of 64 happened and they toured here yeah they were but certainly not at that point with the Ed sullivan show or the the concerts at carnegie hall and and um in washington so until somebody actually says to paul what exactly do you mean <laughs> Uh, heck I wish that. Paul? Yeah. All right. Any further? Uh, any any last comments about the uh, documentary? No. Alan, anything else you want to say? I think we've pretty much covered it. Uh, well, you know, there's always things you can. There was one other thing that I really liked, which was when they were playing. Maybe I'm amazed. You heard a lead guitar part 
It is an honor. Yeah. I love stuff like that. Um, yeah. And actually, there, there were moments when they would play isolated tracks from the release version that we know and then follow that with an alternate take. Like I noticed that um, Tomorrow Never Knows, they did play some of take one that's on the Beatles anthology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the, but, only, the only case I remember, but um, uh, uh, also I think there might've been something in junk that sounds a little unusual to me that I didn't remember hearing before, but you know, it, it, it could be just that when you isolate tracks, things get prominent uh, that, that you're not used to. Uh, he did um, give a slight misimpression of the recording. I mean, if you watch that show and that's all you know about the McCartney album, you would think that he recorded the entire McCartney album in his house. And right. He didn't, and maybe I'm amazed as one of the ones that wasn't done that way. So uh, um, again, just a nitpick. But right. Still. Hmm. Okay. I guess that's a wrap for our discussion about uh, McCartney 321. So why don't we go around the horn and tell everybody what's going on with us and how they can contact us. Darren, we'll start with you. All right. Well, uh, if you want to send me an email, email me at WFUV. The email address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, go on Facebook where I've actually kind of started revamping my uh, two pages. Um, Darren DeVivo is what I refer to as side one. You could uh, send me a friend request. Just Darren DeVivo. The other page is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. That side two, it's going to start having a lot of my music related posts on there. And uh, the other one will be more goofy stuff and sports and whatnot. And uh, uh, I attempted to change the name of the professional page uh but facebook didn't like my option and blocked me from making any more changes for seven days um which makes no sense but you can look for me on facebook send a like follow friend whatever the case might be email and if you want to listen uh i'm on wfuv monday through thursday nights at 10 p.m uh and saturday afternoons 1 to 4 p.m and that's 90.7 fm uh, in the New York City area, but elsewhere outside of the tri-state area, you could stream us at WFUV.org or listen on our app. Okay, very good. Alan, you are next. Okay. Um, for what I'm up to, I'm uh, not up to. I'm reviewing the uh, Harrison set for the Wall Street Journal. Um, that will come out right around the time the album comes out. Um, I actually... I think filed it this morning, um, but uh, yeah, you can't really print a review this early. So uh, yeah, that's that's coming up. Um, and otherwise, you know, working on McCartney Legacy Volume Two, which we'll cover from 1974 to 1980. And um, yeah, if you want to reach me. Uh, the easiest way to do it is on Facebook. I've got two pages. One is Alan Cozen. One is Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, there's also the Things We Said Today group email. Um, feel free to write uh, comments, suggestions, ideas for shows, whatever. Uh, things We Said Today radio show at gmail.com and we can all see it. Uh, we have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab, uh, and we have two Facebook pages, Things We Said Today and Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. Uh, the shows get posted on both of those, and you can find them on Podbean, and you can find them on iTunes, and you can find them on YouTube, and you should subscribe to us on any of those that allow you to subscribe. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, as for me, you can uh, email me directly at everylittlething at att.net. A few things. My uh, new YouTube page, which is Ken Michaels Radio. It's a whole bunch of new interviews that I've done in the last few weeks. And actually, right before doing this show, I had the honor of interviewing Alan White. 
the drummer in Yes for uh, almost 50 years. And the purpose of interviewing him was because of the All Things Must Pass box set about to come out. So we talked a lot about the sessions for All Things Must Pass, a bit about his work with John Lennon. He was on the Instant Karma single, the Imagine album. He was at the Lyceum Ballroom for the UNICEF concert uh, of December 1969. So we talk a bit about that and uh, what's, what's in store for Yes fans. And uh, that's at Ken Michaels Radio, uh, my YouTube page. I also, in the last few weeks, have interviewed, uh, let's see, Dave Ghosty Wills from WFDU. Uh, Hudson Ranny of the I Know I Know podcast and Fernando Perdomo, who's, uh, you know, the co-producer of Ram On, the brand new tribute to Ram. They're all doing Fab Five shows, which is when I ask my guest to name five albums, one from the Beatles, one from each solo Beatle that are your go to albums for today. And also Jonathan Pushkar was a special guest on my uh, YouTube page. He is a power pop artist who just recently released an album called Compositions and covers Junior's Farm on the album with Jeff Britton, the original drummer on the Wings recording. So um, we talk about his career, the new album, Jeff Britton, lots of Wings talk and uh, solo McCartney talk in that particular interview. Again, that's at Ken Michaels Radio. On my other uh, podcast talk more talk we just did a show reviewing paul's pipes of peace album and this coming monday at nine o'clock eastern we'll be talking about this series mccartney 321 so uh that is with um kid o'toole tom hunyadi and joe mayo so we'll get their perspective on this docuseries on my website kenmichaelsradio.com i am giving away copies of that brand new book from Ken Womack and Jason Krupa, again called All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton and Other Assorted Love Songs. And on my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, I prepared a show that uh, has a segment that is a tribute to the concert for Bangladesh, which on August the 1st, will be celebrating, believe it or not, its 50th anniversary. And if you wanna know what radio stations carry the show, every little thing, as a live stream, you can go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, look up the page for every little thing, list all the radio stations, all the broadcast times with links to their websites so you can listen to the show. All right, I think that just about covers everything. Okay. So, just to piggyback off your Alan White, uh huh. Oh, that's that's the, the cover yet, of the new album, The Quest, October first. Uh -huh. From yes, you already know. <laughs> and they're going to tour Europe yeah. beginning next May, I believe. All the information's on Yes's own website. So, if you can't check out that interview with Alan White, what an honor for me to interview him. So much history has, you know, one of the greatest bands in rock. Yes. All right. So thanks so much for tuning in and for Alan Cozen, Slim Whitman, <laughs> and myself, Ken Michael. <laughs> thanks so much for watching. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. <laughs>